welcome tonight. Most of you, I am sure, know either one of these gentlemen up here or the other or both, but uh, in case you don't know one or the other, I'll introduce them both to you. Steve Gregg, uh, teacher, radio talk show host, all these different uh, credentials. You can go down the list and very impressive as well. And Pastor Tom Morris of Arago Community Church right here kind of hosting this forum and uh, the discussion on eternal security. And we look forward to a, a time of, of sharing together and sharing as brothers and sisters and uh, all part of the family of God. But let's start with a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for the opportunities, opportunities you give us to share, to discuss. And Father, even as you have reminded us, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And Father, we come together in love. We come together asking for clarity. We come together asking for wisdom and discernment. And Father... Amidst all of these, Father, we thank you for each person here this evening. We thank you for your word and what we can learn from it. And again, Father, I just ask that you would have your hand upon both of these gentlemen up here, that uh, you would just calm their hearts and encourage them this evening. And I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. uh, What we will do, we're going to start off with uh, some discussion time each person, each man up here, will get uh, 30 minutes, and then after that, we will have 15 minutes of rebuttal time for each one, and then after that, there'll be a 10-minute kind of rebuttal counterpoint thing after that, and then we're going to open it up for questions, so if you have questions, you're welcome to come up front. We'll have a microphone set up here so that we can tape it and and record that as well. Um, Just as a a note, and I'll remind you again, they, they need to be questions, not sermons and, and long, lengthy discussions. Keep them short and keep them questions for the people up here. Uh, as well, I know Steve also has a box in the back somewhere, I, I think, for, for financial gifts, if you want to make those to help cover expenses and things. So if you would do that too. And I think we'll go ahead and get started, and, and Tom will go ahead and start. Thank you. Appreciate Steve coming into the lion's den, as it were, the enemy's camp, <laughs> so to speak. I'm not an enemy. Anybody that loves Jesus is a friend, amen? And uh, the reason why we're here today is to discuss a difficult topic uh, within the Christian church to reconcile among brothers, it seems. But it is my strong feeling that if we don't talk about these hard things, then unity is virtually impossible. We can have a thin crust of unity where we smile and bow to each other and say nice things, but we know deep down we've never ever really discussed those things that divide us. And so we need to talk about them, and we need to talk about them in a manner that is becoming to born-again Christians. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not going to teach in my half hour. I'm going to do what I do better than teaching, I think, anyway, is preach. So (laughs) I, I think there's a little difference, but not much. Uh, Preaching is simply proclaiming God's word, I believe, taking God's truth and saying what it is. Teaching is doing some explanation with it. And Steve is a marvelous teacher. I disagree with him on pretty much everything. (laughs) But uh, uh, I appreciate uh, his willingness to come and and to share and... uh, 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 and to, and, to, and to struggle through these issues so we can be really unified. If we don't struggle through these issues, then all the time while we're smiling in our little rooms, in our little get-togethers, we're compromising. And do you want a compromising man or person in your pulpit? I don't think so. You want somebody who's going to speak as the oracles of God. Somebody who's going to proclaim God's truth as he understands it to be, understands it to be truth. Now, eternal security is the doctrine that once a person becomes born again or a child of God or a Christian, that they will never lose their salvation. Now, a lot of people don't like the phrase, especially people that don't believe it. I like the phrase because I think it simplifies it into a great compact compact term, once saved, always saved. That is, once somebody gives their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, they didn't do it because they earned it. They did it because it was by God's grace through faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And even and so we don't get our salvation by works. We don't earn our salvation by works. Neither do we keep our salvation by our works. The Bible says that in 1 Peter 1, 5, that we are kept by the power of God through faith. We're kept by God's power. So I believe that a Christian can be confident, that the Christian can know that he's saved, he or she is saved beyond a shadow of a doubt. First John 5.13, the Apostle John wrote, For these things are written that you may believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and in believing that you may know that you have eternal life. The Apostle John didn't want you to guess about salvation. He didn't want you to hope like it was some uh, fly in the sky or fly by night kind of scheme. He wants you to be sure that when you die, you will go to heaven. That's the hope of eternal security, to give you the assurance, the, the, the hope that is based on, in, in Hebrews 6.19, a hope that is sure and steadfast, an anchor for the soul. And I'm sure we all want that. And I hope that I can present it in a way that is befitting to the doctrine. Believe me, if I tear it up, it's my fault. It's not the doctrine's fault by any stretch. But it is indeed based on Scripture. If you would turn with me, we're going to go through many verses in the time I have here to, to the, the gospel in a nutshell. It's called John chapter 3, verse 16. <clears throat> the attempt, I believe, by those who teach and believe eternal security, they try to take the scriptures at face value. I'm not saying others don't try to do so, but I can tell you right now that that's my intent is to take the scriptures at face value and try not to read anything or out, out of it other than what it says, but definitely not to try to read anything into it. No eisegesis, as it were, but exegesis. Take out from it what it is God's wanting to say to us. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus, you'll have everlasting life, not temporary life, not life until you stop doing good works, not life until you stop believing you have everlasting life. Turn with me to John chapter 4, verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. If you come to Jesus, you partake of Jesus, you believe in Jesus, the Bible says... You will never thirst. It lays no condition. You will never thirst. Turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. This is a marvelous verse for assurance of salvation. If you've heard his word and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. And you will not come unto condemnation. It's before you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that you come under, under condemnation. And if you're here today, if I might add, if you are here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've never trusted Him for your salvation, the Bible says in John 3.18 that you are condemned. You're condemned already. There's no need to face a judgment because God has already judged you. You need to come to Jesus Christ here today. You need to trust Him for your salvation. But it says you have everlasting life. Turn with me to John chapter 6, verse 35. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. It doesn't take a whole lot of explaining, folks, to explain never. You come to Jesus Christ, you will never hunger, and you will never thirst. Jesus will fulfill that spiritual need that you have for salvation. And it says that you'll never thirst. He provides for your salvation. And once you believe and trust in Him, He meets that need. What a wonderful thing to know that I will never perish, that you will never perish. Uh, follow along in verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. God isn't joking here, folks. If you come to Him, He is not going to cast you out. He will never cast you out for any reason. 
Look at verse 39. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. <laughs> how, much is the Father, how much is Jesus going to lose at the last day? Nothing. How much did Jesus start with in Revelation chapter 5 with 144,000? 144,000. How much did He wind up with in Revelation 14.1? 144,000. When Jesus starts with 100, He ends with 100. Jesus saves and keeps those that become His. In verse 40, And this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. You have everlasting life. Folks, if you really believe that, it's everlasting. That means it ain't ever going to end. And finally, and somebody said amen, just on this topic. <clears throat> I'm just getting a roll here. Uh, John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Folks, eternal means eternal. It doesn't mean until we do something to lose it. It means He gives us eternal life the same way with never. He said that we shall never perish. What a reassurance that is. What a wonderful thing to know that we are in God's hand and He will not cast us out. He'll not let anybody take us out of His hand. Uh, Verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I am really glad here today that the Lord Jesus Christ, the God that we serve, is a powerful God. He is the God who has created heaven and earth. He is the God who has made you and I, and He is the God who has planned out our great salvation. Yes, eternal security isn't based just on the Scriptures, but it's based on what the Scriptures say about God the Father. There is no man, it says, that is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, no man means no man. And that means you also. A lot of folks like to qualify that somehow and say, well, I can. Then this don't mean no man. Amen? Well, I need to make a point here. We probably shouldn't get in an amen contest here. Uh, you know, there's some folks here from our church. I love you dearly. I know you love me dearly. But there's some folks from Steve's side here. And, you know, we have an amen contest going on here. Steve knows more about this than I do. But uh, So anyway, uh, it's based on... Uh, eternal security is based on the power of God. God's power. God has the ability to save us. God has the ability to keep us. And there are several verses... To back this up, if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he was able also to perform. Isn't that marvelous? God has promised to us eternal life. He's able to do it. He's strong enough. He's big enough. The God that created heaven and earth is is strong enough to take you into glory. Uh, Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is able to save you and to not let anything, anything, ladies and gentlemen, take you from him. Would you please turn to Romans chapter 14. In verse 4, 
Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. When you're not able to stand, when you're walking in doubt, when you're walking in unbelief, when you're walking in sin and you're not able to stand, you're not able to stand and, and, and have any kind of assurance or anything like that, recognize that God, He is able. God is able. If you turn with me to uh, Philippians chapter 1, I've got to hurry here. I've run out of time. I've got a lot of things to share. Philippians chapter 1, being confident, verse 6, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a promise from God, folks. God has begun a good work in you, the greatest work that God can do, the work of salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ because of his payment on Calvary's cross. God has begun a great and a marvelous work in your heart. And the Bible says you can be confident that what God has started, he's going to complete it. He's going to finish it. And because God is powerful, we can know that. We can trust. And it's not based on how we feel, ladies and gentlemen. It's based on the written revelation. The Word of God tells us that God is going to complete what it is that He started. But a lot of people think, I've got to keep myself. I've got to keep walking in the faith. I've got to keep doing good. I've got to keep doing things. I've, got to, I've, I've just got to keep myself. Well, the idea is really foreign to Scripture. You trying to keep yourself. Turn with me to First Peter. I already quoted it once. Chapter 1 and verse 5. <clears throat> like to start in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're kept by the power of God through faith. Once you come into the kingdom, once you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, you are kept by His power. Jude, verse 24, explains, says the same thing. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Eternal security is based on the power of God and on the plan of God. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 46. I didn't know I had prepared an hour long opening. <laughs> Uh, Isaiah chapter 46. Eternal security is based on the power of God and it's based on the knowledge of God or what God knows or to be more theologically correct, God's omniscience. Verse 9 of Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. We serve a God who is beyond time, ladies and gentlemen. He's a God of the past and eternity past, and He's the God in eternity future. He doesn't know time like we know time. He's not bound by time. And He has saved you. He has brought you to Himself. It was a part of His plan to save you from eternity past. If you would turn with me to Isaiah, or excuse me, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is something to think about here. God has chosen you from eternity past. I don't care if you're a Calvinist. I don't care if you're an Armenian. I don't care what kind of theological position that you hold. You have to argue with the Word of God if you think somehow God didn't choose us in eternity past. But if we think somehow we can lose our salvation, then what we're doing is we're we're trying to usurp power over God's ability to do things. Can you hear what I'm saying here now? And in doing that, we undermine the prophetic word. If somehow man can usurp authority over God's purposes, God has a purpose. He has saved you from eternity past. And we already know that he who has begun a good work in you is going to complete it. If somehow we can usurp that or somehow lose our salvation, we are taking, we are 
saying, in effect, that my power is stronger than God's. My power can usurp authority over God's will and purpose for my life. And not only that, we are saying that prophecy is guesswork. That the whole book of Revelation and much of the New Testament is entirely guesswork. Why? Because what God has determined in eternity past to take place in eternity future can somehow be stopped by you and I. If we believe we can lose our salvation, then in essence, that's what we're saying about prophecy. That it cannot, it may not come to pass because of what man does. And ladies and gentlemen, I find that hard to understand, I guess. And so we see God's plan is a part of eternal security. God's love is a part of eternal security. God has adopted you into his family. Ladies and gentlemen, what a blessed thing. Now, many of us in this room, I'm sure, and you could turn with me to Romans chapter 8, But many of us in this room, at least in today's society, are uh, fatherless, maybe parentless. But you know what it's like to do without a father. And I know some of what that's like. And one of the most precious things that that I had gotten from Scripture, that once I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I had a father, a wonderful father who loved me. And it says in verse 15, or yes, verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Father. God has adopted you. Excuse me, Abba, Father. God has adopted you, and you can call him Abba. I like what Rabbi Zacharias says. We can call him Abba, and he is our rock. Our lives don't come unhinged, unhinged from our Maker's moorings. We're his son. We're his daughter, and we can cry to him, Abba. And if we think somehow we can lose that, we think that that tender relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where we can call him Abba can somehow be severed by what we can do, I believe is wrong. It's like in Luke, in the story of the prodigal son. Now, a lot of people like to use to that as how a man can fall from faith. I don't believe that's what it shows at all. The prodigal son took his inheritance and left with everything. I've got to hurry here so I can get the 30 minutes out of the way. So forgive me if I don't turn to all the scriptures. But the prodigal son had, uh, uh, had left his father with everything that his father had given him. And they had finally wasted everything and... and and, and, and spent every nickel of his inheritance. And it got to the point where he actually had to live with pigs. And he had, and he, and he had to eat the, what the pigs ate. It was a terrible thing. But then finally he came to himself. And he had thought in his own heart that he wasn't his father's son anymore. That he was separated from his father. And he would say, I would go back. I would go back and say, I want to be like one of my, hired ser- my father's hired servants. Because he knew his father was loving and was kind. And when this prodigal son came back, his father didn't reject him, even though he thought that he should. The son thought that he should. Or that even that, though the son thought that he wasn't even his father's son anymore. But it was the father that ran to him. He never stopped being his father. The father was always the father. He never stopped being that. And, and, and so uh, then we get into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you would turn with me to John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, excuse me. <clears throat> We've talked about the Father and His love and His power and His plan. And now we get into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine of eternal security. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you would, would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. In verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but unto heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus is our advocate, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. He's in the presence of God, and he's there to intercede for you and I. Another verse out of Romans chapter 8. (coughs) 
In Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us which gro- with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now I'd like you to look closely at these two with me, please. As a, verse 26, it's the Spirit who helps our infirmities by praying for us. He makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. But look at verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Who is he that searcheth the hearts? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, we have an advocate. A trial, not a trial lawyer, but a lawyer, as, as, as it were. But no, not a lawyer, a friend, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, an intercessor, one who prays for you and I. When he sees you struggling, when he sees the trouble that you're going through, when he sees the heartache, the pain and the terrible things that you're going through. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is by the right hand side of the father and he's praying for you. Would God the father say no to his son? The advocate, the intercessor, the one who's pleading God on your behalf, I don't believe, would ever say no. To me, this is very strong evidence for the security of the believer. I can, be, I can know that I'm in the faith. I can know that for beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm secure because Jesus Christ is pleading my case. What a wonderful thing to know that I've got a friend, a wonderful friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see... That uh, he's an advocate, he's an intercessor. And then we come into the ministry, and that's not counting his death and, and his resurrection. We live because of his death and his resurrection. We have eternal life because of it. Because uh, he died, we can live. Um, the Holy Spirit has a ministry to us that guarantees our salvation. If you would turn to me, please, to, with me to Ephesians chapter 1 again. In verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> Would you uh, turn with me to Ephesians 4? Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. According to Ephesians 1.13, After you have believed, after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say that you're sealed until you lose it somehow. It says you are sealed until the day of redemption. I believe the Bible teaches that that day of redemption is the time of the rapture. Which is another thing we disagree on, I believe. (coughs) Maybe some other time. (coughs) But we are secure until the day of redemption because the Holy Spirit seals us. Now that sealing is something that nobody can break. No man can break. In fact, the only one that can break the seal is the Lamb of God. Is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. If you would turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Um, would somebody mind getting uh, uh, maybe two glasses of water downstairs of somebody from the church? Uh, <clears throat> my thoughts, four minutes. And you just thought it seemed like eternity. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereupon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Folks, there wasn't anybody to open the book except the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this may not be concrete proof that, that you can't break the seal, but I think it's pretty good proof. I think it's good proof to know that you're sealed until the day of redemption. That because of God has given you His Holy Spirit, His mark, actually not His mark, His very person, to live inside of your heart. And that is God's guarantee. Yes, His guarantee. His down payment. That you're going to be saved. Turn back with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 14. I hope you're having fun going through the Scriptures. Because that's what all this is about. Amen? Amen. You can all say amen on that one. This is what this is about. It's open up the Word. If you want to listen to the the opinions of Tom Morris, I would be real glad about that. But we want to listen to the opinion of God's Word. Amen? Amen. I hope you like that better. Ephesians 1.14. Well, let me read verse 13 again. Whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of of the purchased possession and under the praise of His glory. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is, is God's guarantee that He's going to complete the work that He started. He's told you by His power, by His plan, and by His love, He has started a good work in you. And He, he started that good work that, that came through the avenue of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He gave you His Holy Spirit as a guarantee, the earnest, the down payment for your salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 says the same thing. Let's go ahead and turn there, please. Now he that wrought us for the self thing, same thing is God, who hath given to us the earnest of the Spirit, the down payment. Folks, I might go back on a promise. I might go back on my word. I might not make the complete payment on a car sometime. Why? Because I'm a man. I'm full of all sorts of problems. And if you knew me, you'd shout amen about that. But God doesn't go back on His promises. He gave you His Holy Spirit, the earnest the earnest money, if you will. The down payment for your salvation. There's nothing that can take that away. He's Amen. going to save you. He's going to save you. Now I just hope that you come to believe that today and trust Him. Trust Him with all your heart. Thank you. That went very fast. That was a very fast half hour. First of all, I want to state how happy I am to be invited here. I've heard sermons like the one we just listened to all my life. I was raised in a Baptist church. I began preaching in a Baptist church. I've, I could not count the number of times I've heard good sermons on eternal security. That is one of the better ones I've heard. I'm just glad I have the chance to answer it. That's the difference between most of the times I've heard them. Usually I have to sit in the pews... Uh, and not have anything to say in response. And tonight, I appreciate Tom and the rest of you allowing me to have such an opportunity. I want to make it very clear that the announced topic is eternal security. And uh, on the one hand, it seems that since Tom is defending eternal security, I should be defending eternal insecurity. And that is not actually the position. Actually, I believe in eternal security also. I'm eternally secure. But my view of eternal security is considerably different. Uh, I believe that the Christian believer is secure. I am a believer, and therefore I am secure. I do not believe that the former believer is secure. If somebody asks me, do you believe in the security of the believer, how could I say anything but yes? Of course, the Bible gives, makes tremendous promises to the believer. It makes no positive promises to the former believer. So, the condition of this security is believing. And the Bible makes it very clear that those who do not believe will be lost. Now, it does not say if they used to believe, but they now are unbelievers, they'll be saved. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. And I would like to address, when it comes to our time for rebuttals, 
the particular scriptures that Tom used that might sound as if it meant that. But I want to present my case positively, first of all. I believe that when we consider what the Bible says about salvation, we have to make a distinction in our own exegesis of the scriptures to recognize what is said about the church corporately and what is said about the believer as an individual. Most of the scriptures that were quoted and that we usually quote about eternal security are statements that are made to the church about the church. God began a good work in the church of the Philippians. He continued and will continue His good work in the church. The church is God's purpose. The church is God's bride. Uh, The church will never be snatched out of His hand. But the question of individual participation in that entity is everywhere in the Scripture said to be conditional. Conditional upon faith. Now, I heard tonight and I've often heard people say that if you don't believe in unconditional eternal security, then you must believe in salvation by works because uh, you can't believe that you'd lose your salvation unless you believed in salvation by works. I've been a Christian for 45 years. I've been a preacher for 30 of those years. I've never believed in salvation by works. I don't believe in salvation by works at this time. I believe that I, if I die today, I'll go to heaven regardless of... Uh, I don't think God's going to bring up my works to decide whether I'm saved or not. I will be saved because of my faith in Jesus Christ. It'll, actually, I'll be saved because of Christ. My faith in Him is that which makes me a participant in that salvation that is in Christ. Now, I believe that the security of the church... Now, when I say the church, I don't mean this building or any building. The church is the body of Christ, the organic community of believers who are redeemed, been born again, they have the Spirit of God, and they're all members one of another worldwide. That's the church. That entity, as an entity, is unconditionally destined for glory because that's God's eternal purpose. His eternal purpose is for the church to come into the fullness of of the likeness of Christ. When it comes to me as an individual or you as an individual, the Bible says some very specific things about my participation in the destiny of the church. I'd like you to turn, if you would, to what I consider to be one of the classic statements from John. Many of the scriptures today quoted are from John. I I would like to quote or share a lot of scriptures from the book of John and 1 John also. This is from 1 John, chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. The Apostle John wrote, that, and this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life. Now, us is a plural, of course. The church, those of us who are in Christ, He has given us eternal life. Us. And this life is in His Son. Now, where is the life? Is the life in me? The life is in Christ. God has given us eternal life in Christ. If I am in Christ then that's where the life is. And if I am in Christ, then I have eternal life. If I'm not in Christ, I don't, because the life is not in me. The life is in His Son, it says. God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. I hope that you qualify. I know I do tonight. I know Tom does. We are in Christ. We have that eternal life. He that does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now, all that John is telling us is this, that eternal life is located in one place, in Jesus Christ. Salvation is in Christ. The question is, am I in Christ? There's no question as to whether eternal life is in Christ. If I cease to participate in Christ, the eternal life is still there. It's still eternal. It's just that I have ceased to participate. If we unplug these microphones from the wall, if we unplug the PA system, the electricity is still in the walls. But we're not tapping it because we're not connected to it. The individual connects to this eternal life by connecting to Christ. And that is connected by faith, according to the Scripture. There are people in the Scripture who ceased to be connected to Christ. And as John tells us, they must not have that life anymore because he that has the Son has life. And he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. In Galatians 5.4, Paul said of the Galatians, You have become estranged from Christ. Well, if you're estranged from Christ, you're not, you're not, you don't have him anymore. If you're estranged from your ex-wife, well, you don't have her as your wife anymore. She's, you're estranged. You're separated. And Paul goes on to say, you've fallen from grace. A person cannot fall from grace unless they've been in grace. 
You cannot be estranged from Christ unless there was a relationship from which to be estranged. You see, an individual can know Jesus Christ and be saved and be participant in that eternal life that is in Him. But because of apostasy, because of rejection of Christ at a later time of their life, and I have known too many people who have done that to deny that that happens. The Bible also tells us it happens, as we'll see. When a person is estranged from Christ, he doesn't have the Son. And this, the life is in the Son. If you'll look with me over John chapter 15, we see that Jesus teaches the same thing in the book of John of all places. The place where the vast majority of eternal security texts are drawn from is the Gospel of John and the, Gospel, and the book of Romans. Those two books more than any others. And yet, both of those teach us a conditional eternal security based upon the condition of faith in Christ. In John 15, we have the well-known parable of the vine and the branches. We don't have to read the whole thing. I'm sure you understand uh, and are familiar with it. But in verses 5 and 6, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me. The word abides means remains. He that remains in me. Another translation of that same word in the, in the English Bible is continues. He that continues in me. He says, like a vine continuing to be attached to the branch. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is cast out as a branch. Now, you can't be cast out as a branch if you were never a branch. You can't cease to abide or remain in him if you're never in him. He's talk, he says, you are branches in me. Now, if you will remain in me, you'll be fruitful. If you don't remain in me, something else will happen, he says. If you don't remain attached to Christ, if you don't remain in him, he says, what happens then? That person is cast out as a branch, is withered. They gather them up and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. The Apostle Paul gave the same imagery, only changed the plant from a vine to an olive tree in Romans. Chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, I'll bring you up to speed if you're not familiar with it. The saved community, the elect, the Israel of God, or whatever Paul may wish to call it in different places, is likened to an olive tree. There are branches that were original members of that tree. The Jews, they were attached to it. Some of them have been broken off because of their lack of faith. We who are Gentiles have been grafted on because of our faith. It is faith that is the condition of being on or off of this tree. The natural branches were cut off because they didn't have faith. The unnatural branches were grafted in because they did have faith. And they stay there because they have faith. It is conditioned upon the faith. Paul said in Romans 11, if we look at uh, verse... I uh, don't want to read the whole uh, passage. It would take me too long. Let's say... Uh, verse 17, if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand, that is, you, re you are in because of what? Faith. You stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Well, why? I thought I'm eternally secure. Well, but you better be afraid. Well, secure people don't have anything to be afraid of, do they? Well, it depends. It depends on if the security is conditional or not. For if God did not spare the natural branches, that's the Jews who defected and were cut off, and in Paul's day, many of them died and were lost. He may not spare you either. What? He's talking about me, who I who have faith, I am attached to this tree. I'm participating in the root and the fatness of this tree. The life of the tree is in me. He might not spare me. Paul, come on. I mean, I thought you were supposed to uh, give me more security than that. Well, Paul says this in verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. Now, that word if is found in many significant passages related to individual salvation. You are secure if you continue. We see that again and again in Paul's writings and in Hebrews. I don't know who you think wrote Hebrews. If you think that was Paul, that's fine. If you think it was someone else, that's fine too. But 
Paul says it in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 21 and following. Paul says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. So, saved. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith. Oh, I see. It's conditioned upon if I continue in the faith. Now, that's Paul saying that. That's not some you know, heretic saying that. That's Paul saying, you, God is going to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight if you continue in the faith. Does everybody continue in the faith? No, not everybody does. Most of us have known people who have... If that servant is, is, is in that role, fine, blessed is he. Truly I say to you, he will make him ruler over all that he has. Verse 45, but if that servant, not another servant, but that one, if that same servant who has the opportunity to be faithful until Jesus comes and be rewarded, if that same servant, he says, says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink with the drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour that he is not aware of and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now, what is the portion of the unbelievers, I wonder, when Jesus comes back? Is that salvation? I don't think so. As I read it in First or Second Thessalonians 1 9, it says that Jesus will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and that obey not the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the portion of the unbelievers. Now, this servant that God has appointed to do a certain thing, if he is faithful and his master comes, he'll be blessed, he'll be ruler over all many cities or whatever. But if that same servant says, Well, I don't think I'm going to follow my Lord anymore, and he defects from the Lord, then when his Lord comes, that servant will share the same fate as the unbeliever. That's Jesus talking. I can't think of any higher authority to quote on the subject, to tell you the truth. Jesus is the one whose teaching on this has got to be taken as you know, the final authority, of course. In 2 Timothy, we have a passage which sometimes people quote in favor of eternal security, surprisingly enough. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2... 11 through 13, Paul says this. He says, This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now, those who teach an unconditional eternal security, and they say it's not conditional on faith, they point out, if we are faithless, He abides faithful. Right? In other words, I, in my faith is not an issue. If I don't have any more faith someday, yet God's faithfulness will pull me through because He abides faithful. Well, did you miss what Paul said in the immediate preceding thing? If we deny Him, He'll deny us. He cannot deny Himself, but He can deny us if we deny Him. Now, the point is here, if we don't believe it, that doesn't change it. That's what it means. If we're faithless, if I don't believe this, well, that doesn't change anything. God's still faithful. He's going to do what He says He's going to do. He's going to keep His promises and His threats. What's His promise? If we endure, we'll reign with Him. What's His threat? If you deny Him, He'll deny you. Do you believe it? It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It's going to happen anyway because God's faithful and He does what He says He's going to do. And this is what He says He's going to do. He can't deny Himself, but He can deny you if you deny Him. Jesus told His disciples... He that denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father which is in heaven. I just heard that Jesus is our advocate in heaven. Well, he is. He's, he's the advocate of the faithful. He's the advocate of those who trust in him. But of those who deny him, he's not their advocate. He denies them. Now, I don't see how anyone could feel very secure denying Christ, knowing that Jesus has promised that he will deny them when they stand before the Father. I don't think that's a very secure feeling, frankly. Now, I'm... Secure because I, I don't intend to deny Him. I hope you don't. And I've often wondered why people really get excited as they do about this eternal security doctrine. It used to strike me that it was just a backslider's concern. I mean, I'm not a backslider and I'm not concerned about conditional or unconditional security. I, I'm secure because I believe in Christ and that any child can do that. And I can do that till the day I die and I intend to do so. So I'm secure. What's the problem? 
I don't intend to be saved by my works. I can't show you a great list of good works that would outweigh the bad works I've done in my life. I'm sure it's probably the opposite. Probably my bad works would outweigh the good. That's not an issue in my salvation. The issue in my salvation is, do I have a faith in Jesus Christ that commands me and compels me to be loyal to Him and to define my task in life as being a follower of His and seeking to please Him? If that is the faith that resides in me, I am saved and I am secure. But if I depart from that faith, as many people have, and the Bible says many shall, many shall depart from the faith, the Bible says. Uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander had shipwrecked the faith of many people. Well, if my faith shipwrecks, I, that's an interesting metaphor. It sounds like it sinks. It sounds like it's lost. If I lose faith, then I lose the grace. Do you know that? What's it say in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? I think it was quoted tonight. I don't know if it was or not. By grace you've been saved. How? Through faith. Grace comes through faith. If you think I'm making too much of that point from that verse, you can look at Romans 5 2, where Paul says in Romans 5 2 that through Christ we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We have access to grace through faith. Do I have faith? Yes. Then I have grace. Do I deny the faith? Do I lose faith? Do I depart from faith? If so, then I, my access to grace is cut off. And so the scripture was quoted a couple times tonight. Uh, 1 Peter 1 5 says that we are kept by the power of God through faith. Unto salvation ready to be revealed in that through faith. That's a big through. How can, if I have faith today, let's say, let's say tomorrow I decide I don't want to believe in Christ anymore, and so I live the rest of my life without faith. Am I being kept by the power of God? How could I? I'm kept by the power of God through faith. If I don't have faith, then that doesn't apply to me, does it? It only applies to those who have faith. There is only security for the believer. There is not security for the former believer. That is scriptural. The Bible provides no promises to the person who is a former believer. True, the Bible does make unconditional promises concerning the the community of believers. The, the flock. That, you know, Jesus is always going to have a flock. If, if, but an individual sheep can wander away. Did you know that? An individual sheep can wander away from the flock. So it says that. And in fact, many can. In Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, when Isaiah said that about Israel, which was God's flock, were the Israelites of whom he spoke saved? If so, then why was it necessary for God to lay the iniquity of them on Him if they were already saved without that? Wandering away from God is to be estranged from God. This life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. That those that abide in Him continue to be in the, in the vine. And they have the life of the vine in them. A branch that is cut off and does not abide in the vine is withered and dies and gets burned up that's not a picture of salvation in Scripture ever. Uh, the servant that could have been faithful, if he defects, he's, he's lost. He shares the fate of the unbeliever, Jesus said. Paul said that if we deny him, he will deny us. Now, Paul's not writing to unbelievers, by the way. He's writing to Timothy. He's not even writing to a church. He's writing to a man, Timothy, a Christian man. Paul says, if we endure, you and me, Tim, if we endure, we'll reign. If we deny Him, now we has to mean at least Paul and Timothy. If it takes in any more, that's fine. But it can't, re- it can't eliminate the man who's speaking and the man who he's talking to. If we deny Him. These are Christian men. If, if I, a Christian man, deny Him, what will God do if I deny Him? Well, God will deny me, Paul said. Now, I don't know if you want to listen to Jesus or Paul or the writer of Hebrews or Peter or John, more. I don't know who, which of these guys impress you most. To my mind, they're all speaking from God and they all speak the truth. And that is why I cannot accept any doctrine that says that people are saved unconditionally. There is a condition for salvation. It is the condition of faith, as I understand the Scripture. Now, look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, if you would. And there are quite a few passages in Hebrews that are kind of classics on this. And I may not be turning to the one that you would think I would in Hebrews 10, because there's an earlier passage in Hebrews 10 back around verse 26 that is often used in this argument. But I want to look at the last verses of Hebrews 10. Because 
the writer of Hebrews is quoting uh, from Haggai and uh, or Habakkuk, excuse me. And he says uh, in verses 37 through 39 of chapter 10, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now, the just shall live by faith. This is, if anything, the verse that Paul appeals to more often than most others. He does also appeal to Genesis 15, 6 about as much. To establish the doctrine of justification by faith. It's Habakkuk 2, 4. The just shall live by faith. Now, he quotes Habakkuk. He says, the just shall live by faith. But if... Now, here's a bad translation. Anyone draws back. If you look at the Greek, you'll find that it says, if he draws back. The just man will live by his faith. But if he draws back, who? That just man who's been justified by his faith. If he draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. Some are, apparently, because the Bible speaks to them. He says, not, not us, not me and you, I hope. But he says, some do apparently. We're not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Believe unto the saving of the soul. The ultimate salvation comes through continuing in faith. If we continue to believe unto the end, we are believing unto the ultimate salvation of our souls. We're saved in the meantime. I'm saved right now because I have eternal life. Because I'm in Christ. But if I do not abide in Christ, well, there's no eternal life outside of Him. This life is in His Son. And if I do not abide in Him where the life is, there's none anywhere else. That's the teaching of the New Testament. It says over in Revelation chapter 3, I think I'd quote from the same books that Tom quoted from to make sure that we understand that these books are not all stacked on the side of an unconditional eternal security. Not at all. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. As it it, can that happen? Now, some might say, well, it doesn't say anyone's names really will be blotted out of the book of life. It just says that those who overcome their names won't be blotted out of the name of the book of life. It doesn't ever say anyone will. Well, Revelation does say that some at least can. Over in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 19. Revelation 22.19 says, And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, taking away from the words of this book seems like something that anyone's capable of doing. I mean, would you be incapable of taking away words? If it's impossible, then why even make a warning about it? Obviously, it's possible to do. And if anyone does that, what will happen to them? Well... He says their name will be taken out of the book of life. Their part will be taken out of the book of life. Now, what happens to people who are not in the book of life on the day of judgment? According to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15, it says, anyone not found in the written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, overcomers, Jesus said, will not have their name blotted out of the book of life. Certain people under certain conditions, it says can. Because God says, if you take away from the words of this book, then I will take away your part from the book of life. Well, if your name is taken out of the book of life, are you in there? No, it's been taken out. By who? None less than God Himself. If He took it out, who's going to put it back in? Nobody. If your name's not there, where do you go when you die? If you, if you, on the day of judgment, to the lake of fire. Is anything unclear about this? I don't really understand why this would be unclear. Now, I realize that a number of scriptures have been presented that sound as if they may teach that you can't be lost once you're saved. And I don't know if I can address this as quickly as I want to. I'm going to have to quit in about three minutes here or four. But there were several scriptures presented from the Gospel of John. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He that drinks of this water shall never thirst. Or in John chapter 6, he that eats this bread will never hunger. He that drinks this drink will never thirst. Uh, what we have in these statements are all, you'll notice they're all in John and they all have the same grammatical construction. They all have a conditional. He that does this, who, is, who meets this condition, believes, drinks, eats, whatever, shall never something, perish usually, never perish, never thirst, never hunger, whatever. Those who meet this condition shall never have this bad result, it says. 
Now what is the condition? He that believes, he that eats, he that drinks, all of those are in the present tense in the Greek. Look them up. He that is eating, he that, is, he that is eating shall never hunger. He that is drinking shall never thirst. He that is believing shall never perish. Now, that doesn't mean if he stops being one who is eating, he'll never hunger. And if he stops being one who's drinking, he'll never thirst. If he stops being one who's believing, he'll never hurt. No, it is the one who is believing who never perishes. While believing, that is. And that John meant it that way is evident from another very interesting verse in John chapter 3. Which you'll, I'll have to close with this because it's my last minute or so here. But uh, in John chapter 3, it says in verse 36, He who believes, present tense, in the Son has everlasting life. Why? Because whoever is believing is abiding in Him and has the life that is in Him. And he who does not believe, present tense, the Son, present, future, shall not see life. Now, this statement, he that does not believe shall not see life, isn't that the same grammatical construction as he that believes shall never perish? He that does not believe shall not see life. What? As long as he doesn't believe. Now, there may be many people who didn't believe at the moment this was written, of whom it was true of them, that they didn't believe and should not see life, but who, reading the Gospel of John, came to life came to believe. Well, shall they never see life? No, of course. When you cease to be in the condition of unbelief, then it ceases to be true that you will not see life. It is those who are unbelieving and continuing to be unbelieving that will, in that condition, never see life. Likewise, those who are believing and continue believing shall never, in that condition, perish. Those who are eating and continue eating will never, in that case, hunger. It is always a continuous present tense. Whoever is believing, whoever is eating, whoever is... Drinking, that person, assuming he's continuing to do that, shall never come into a state of hunger, thirst, or perishing. But of course, that's a condition, isn't it? What if you're not eating? What if you're not drinking? What if you're not believing? Well, then it's very clear in Scripture. You will perish. You will hunger. You will thirst. You'll die. And that is my first presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. So now we're going to start 15 minutes each for rebuttal. Okay. Uh, I'd like to begin where Steve left off. He would turn to uh, John chapter 3. Um, Steve is correct that in many of the verses that I quoted about uh, believing, hungry, and thirsting, there are in the present tense. But does the present tense always mean a continued uninterrupted, uninterrupted action? Um, no. It doesn't. Um, first off, I'm not against anybody saying, well, this is what the Greek says because I do it all the time too. And I do it when I preach. And in fact, I'll probably do it with Colossians 1.23 where it says, if you continue, that could be since you continue in the Greek. But I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't know a Greek A from a Greek. I don't know an alpha from an omega. I only know what this says. And... I've looked it up in several major translations, the New, New King James, the New International Version, and the New American Standard, and the regular King James, and every one of them says that you believe, believeth, uh, believest thou. Uh, every one of them doesn't say that you must keep believing or continue to believe. Uh, now, I know Steve that didn't say that, but uh, also, before I go any farther, if I insinuated that people that don't believe in eternal security aren't saved, I'm sorry about that. That is not my intention to be here tonight. Uh, my intention is to draw more from the Word of God. It's not to judge anybody's salvation. So I'm sorry about that if I did say that, or insinuated it even. Uh, however, I do think that you miss out on a blessing in not understanding it. Uh, not to say that I'm smarter than anybody else or, or more enlightened. But anyway, uh, the present tense doesn't always mean a, a continuous, uninterrupted action. Not by any stretch. Because if you were to turn to John, keep your finger in John but, uh, 3, but turn to John 4, verse 13. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now this is in the present tense. Now, if we're going to be consistent with this continuous, uninterrupted action, the person who is drinking from Jacob's well here would have to keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking 
You get the point. It's in the continuum or in the, the present. It's in the present tense. Uh, they couldn't just drink one time and be satisfied or be filled. They had to keep drinking if, if the idea is consistent with the present tense. Salvation verses don't have to be always in the present tense. In Acts chapter 16, verse 33, would you turn there, please? They're in the Aorus tense. Now, I'm not an English scholar either. I'm a lay pastor, by and large. I'm in training, as it were, but... Uh, we can understand the word together. In verse 31 of Acts 16, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's in the Aorus tense. That talks about a fact, a single action that has happened. If you believe, one single action that's happened in the past. If you believe, you have everlasting life. Now, the problem with this that I see is when we say that it really means continuous, uninterrupted action, we're taking authority over, uh, over the word that it doesn't seem to, to be declaring to us. We're, we're in effect, I think we have to be careful that we're not adding things to the word by saying you must keep believing. By keeping believing, that's not in the gospel message. You've got to believe and you've got to keep believing. That's not what the Bible says. You've got to believe. And Jesus gave the best definition of what it means to come to faith in Jesus Christ in just a few verses before John 3.16. He says in verses 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now Jesus is telling us about the example of Numbers chapter 21 of the serpent in the wilderness, the brazen serpent. The, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, had sinned grievously against God and God was going to toast them. He was tired of them. He was going to kill them. And he was going to make another people out of Moses. But God talked him out of it. And God, so God made a way out. for, Or excuse me, God sent the, uh, the fiery serpents down to kill the people. And if, as the people were bit by these fiery serpents, they died. Well, after a while, a bunch of the people saw what was happening. Could you imagine what it was like getting bit by one of these fiery serpents, serpents and watch it slither off? Well, Joe over there, or Yahim, or whatever his name was, he got bit, he died, I'm going to die. And you've watched all these people die, and you go to Moses, we need some help. We need some grace here. <laughs> we need some mercy. Uh, ask God for some help. And so God gave him some help. He gave him a brazen serpent to put on a pole. And all they had to do was look on that serpent to be healed. That's all they had to do was look. They were bitten, they were dead, and they were going to die. It was a guarantee. They looked on that serpent and they were healed. They were made whole. They were saved, as it were. Let me tell you, folks, you've been bit by the serpent of sin and you're going to die. It's a guarantee. I hope it sends a cold shiver down your spine. But you need to look to Jesus. Just like that brazen serpent was lifted up and they just looked. They just looked believing. That, that by looking on Him, they'll, they'll be saved. They'll be healed. You need to look to Jesus. That's the biblical example of what it means to believe. So I think we need to go to the Word of God when it starts talking to us about specific details of what belief means, and rather than trying to uh, use something, I think, inconsistent with the present tense on the Greek. I think Jesus has given us a good example of what it means to believe. Look unto Jesus, the one who was lifted up. Several of the other verses I'd like to look at is uh, John chapter 15 that Steve had mentioned about abiding in the vine. That's a very interesting passage. <clears throat> I think it has to do uh, less with salvation and more with our usefulness to God. If you will notice in verse 6, he says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them. Men gather them. When Jesus Christ comes, the angels are going to gather people. In the second coming of Christ in Matthew 24. The angels are the ones going to be doing the gathering. The men here, Jesus is speaking just simply of of people that have been trodden underfoot. Matthew 5 talks about you're the salt of the 
salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be trodden underfoot of men. Your testimony, if you're not abiding in Christ as far as living for him at the time, you are, your testimony is toast. And men walk on you. They walk all over you. Many of you know that as you've, if you've lived for Christ and you're trying to witness with a cigarette dangling out of your mouth. Your, your, your testimony is worthless. It's just good to be trodden under the foot of men. So I, I find it suspect that this is actually talking about uh, uh, anything rather than, than uh, Christians' uh, usefulness to men or to mankind because of the fact that, that men are the ones that do the gathering here. Now, if you would turn to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> I'll try to address as many of these as I can. Uh, to be honest, I don't have the answers for some of them. Um, I wish I did, did. I could probably write a book. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. About wore my Bible out the last few days preparing for this. Ephesians 5 and verse 4, it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Um, well, during, in the whole book of Galatians, it's a treatise that the Apostle Paul has against the Galatian believers who are trying to find righteousness through the law. So in effect, what they're doing Paul is chastising them for trying to do good deeds here and not evil. He's chastising them for trying to keep the righteousness of the law and not live in the loving liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ. So a believer can be severed from Christ in the sense that they're not walking in the full presence of his love, in the full presence of the life that he's offered to you. He's offered you freedom apart from the law, apart from doing good deeds. The freedom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And if you try to live this life according to the law, if you try to find righteousness according to the law, you, in effect, have fallen from grace. The grace of living the Christian life. The grace of living a life that is full of the love of God. If you're going to try to live this life according to the law, you've been separated from Christ as a way of life. You've been separated from grace as a way of life. And you're trying to work and to live in a righteousness that God is not pleased with. And then we go to Romans chapter 11. Um, A very interesting passage of Scripture. I I don't believe that, that it's warranted to talk about the salvation of the individual in this passage, as Paul is talking to Gentiles. I believe he's talking to the Gentiles as a whole. We are in, according to the Bible, the times of the Gentiles. Luke chapter 21 talks about us being in the times of the Gentiles. And in verse 25 of Romans 11, Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. God has worked with his children Israel up until the time, actually, of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last and the greatest of the prophets. And then, after that, the times of the Gentiles or the times of the church came in, uh, well, some argue about it. I believe it was at the time of Pentecost. And if you want to get more specific, it could be at Acts chapter 10 about the time when Cornelius was saved. But we are in the times of the Gentiles. We are in the church age. Israel had a chance to accept Jesus as their Messiah, and they blew it. Keep your finger in Romans and turn to Matthew 21. Start reading in verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. 
and given unto a nation or, or ethos, other people, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. God has given to us as Gentiles a wonderful privilege to be abiding in his church. But, ladies and gentlemen, just like the Jews were kicked out, we can be kicked out too. I don't believe Romans 11 has anything to do with individual salvation. It has everything to do with whether us as Gentiles are willing to to walk in the fullness that God has for us. Um, let's turn to... Uh, let's see, what other ones? Oh yeah, Second Timothy 2. A lot of people ask, or, or like Steve has said, um, he... he, he he says that you have to. Uh, it's hard to think and talk at the same time. Did you have, did you guys know that? Uh, and uh, Steve has said that salvation is contingent on us keeping believing. You, know, you not only have to believe, but you got to keep believing. Well, if that's true, then John the Baptist is lost, because in Matthew chapter eleven, John the Baptist said, "Are you the one, or do we look for another?" John the Baptist had proclaimed. He had said, "Thou." This is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And after he was cast in jail, he sent his disciples to say, Are you the one? So John the Baptist doubted. Jesus went on to explain to his people that John the Baptist wasn't lost. He wasn't a bad person. He didn't lose his salvation. He was the greatest prophet there ever had been. He says, Would you come to see a reed shaken in the wind? He understood this is part of Christ's intercessory with us. When we're doubting, when we're in unbelief, Christ is interceding for us. And if you look at verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Bible says that you have been baptized into the body of Christ. You are no longer your own. The Bible says you've been bought with a price. And being baptized into the body of Christ... God cannot deny you. Christ cannot deny you because in doing so, he would have to deny himself. If you believe not, he says, he abideth faithful. Otherwise, he'd be denying himself and he can't do it. You are a child of God. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. You are in Christ. You're in the body of Christ. Now, Steve got me with this verse on the radio one day. Got me good. Uh, the idea is, for, for those who believe you can lose your salvation, is that if we deny him, he'll also deny us. Uh, well, if we look at it in context, verses 11 and 12, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. I believe he is talking about our rewards there. The reward in verse 12 is if we suffer... We shall reign. There are rewards in heaven. The Bible talks about uh, treasuring up, make, get, putting treasures in heaven as opposed to those that don't have any treasures. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, about how you're going to be judged by fire. And the works that you do are going to be judged by fire. And the works are, are comparable to gold, silver, and precious stone, and wood, hay, and stubble. And the Bible says that as this fire of judgment falls during the Bema judgment seat of Christ, the works that counted for nothing, and some folks ain't going to have nothing. Let me tell you, a lot of folks think that because you believe in the security of the believer, that that means you're going to forego judgment somehow. Everybody's going to be judged. Now, I'd rather be a janitor in heaven than rule in hell. Amen? Amen? But I don't want to just be a janitor in heaven. I wouldn't mind having some riches in there. Amen? And so, uh, I'd like to suffer for him if, if, he, if, he, if he wills that. But the works that we do are going to be burned up. And the ones that last, the ones that endure, are the gold, silver, and precious stone. The ones that are no good are the wood, hay, and stubble. But he says in there, you'll be saved, yet so is by fire. You know, we're going to be judged. Is that it? Oh, okay. Well, I just got going there. That's a very thorough 
a very thorough rebuttal covered quite a lot of ground in 15 minutes. I hope I can cover as much. Um, well, the temptation is to respond to the things that Tom said in his rebuttal, where I'm supposed to do that in my second rebuttal. I'm supposed to respond now to the things he said in his presentation. So I might, uh, I'll, I'll do that as quickly as I can. Maybe I can get to some of these other points as well. In his presentation, Tom said, the idea of keeping yourself is foreign from Scripture. And he said that in order to contrast that with the fact that we are kept by the power of God through faith. Well, of course, keeping yourself is not foreign from Scripture at all. The book of Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God. The book of 1 John says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. The idea of keeping yourself is very much not foreign from Scripture. It's intrinsic in Scripture. There are many things that we are told to keep ourselves in and from that have to do with our relationship with God. It is true that the Bible does not teach that our salvation ultimately depends on our strength. It is the power of God that keeps us. But we have to keep ourselves in the faith in order that the power of God is, is, uh, is granted to keep us. We are kept by the power of God through faith. So the idea that it's foreign to Scripture to say that you know, we keep ourselves is, simply isn't true. You can look up the Scriptures you want you get a concordance, you'll find many times we're told to keep ourselves from idols, uh, in the love of God, and so forth, and keeping yourself is certainly uh, a biblical concept. Um, Tom said, if we say that we can lose our salvation, we're saying that prophecy is guesswork. I wasn't quite sure how he meant that, but I guess what he was saying is that uh, he was talking about revelation and such, and, and I guess the prophecy is about people being saved. The Bible doesn't prophesy that Steve Gregg is going to be in heaven. There's, uh, the name Steve Gregg is not there anywhere. The Bible says that those who are faithful until the end will be in heaven. Jesus said, those who endure to the end shall be saved. I would like to fill in the name Steve Gregg because I'm going to be faithful to the end. I don't, that's not a boast. I'm kept by the power of God. It doesn't take my strength. I'm kept by the power of God through faith. And since an infant can have, or almost an infant, can have faith, I can do what a child can do. It's not meritorious. It's just what I'm required to do. And as I continue to trust Jesus Christ, who else would I trust? Uh, well, then, I will be kept. And, uh, but my name isn't in the book. I mean, my name's written in heaven. It's not in this book here. So there's no prophecy of the Scripture. If I said, well, I, Steve Ray, could conceivably lose my salvation if I, if I departed from the faith, I'm not denying prophecy. The prophecy doesn't ever say that Steve Gregg is saved, and your name's not in there either. The Bible says that those who believe will be saved. The question of whether I'm one of those who believe has a great deal to do with whether I believe or not. And that's something I decide about to do. Um, the prodigal son was brought up, and he specifically said that when he came back, his father didn't reject him. True. When he came back, his father didn't reject him. When he was away from his father, though, what was his status? Well, we might say, well, he's still a son, right? Still biologically related. Yes, but what was his father's assessment of his son's condition when he was away? Do you recall? His father told us. He said, my son was lost. But now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. Now, that prodigal son, though he had a history of relationship to his father, because he had rejected his father, his father said, my son in that condition was lost and dead. It's amazing how many times Calvinists like to talk about dead and sins as, as a proof that someone is lost and can't even believe. But the word dead certainly isn't a, an expression of having life, whatever it means. Uh, if he was dead, if he was why would Jesus use those terms? By the way, that is not... I mean, Jesus told the story however he wanted to, right? It was a parable. He put the words in the man's mouth because they said what Jesus wanted to get across. This boy, when alienated from his father, though related biologically, was lost. And he was dead, as is everyone who's apart from Christ, whether they were with him or not previously. Now, he said that Christ pleads for us at the right hand of God. Would God ever say no to Christ? No, he would not say no to Christ. But again... Christ is pleading on behalf of His people. Christ is the intercessor for those who believe in Him. If I cease to be one of His people because I don't believe in Him, He doesn't plead for me then. He pleads for His people. The Bible makes it very clear that if you depart from God, you're not His people. The Jews were God's people, were they not? And yet in Hosea, God says, because they had departed from the He says, you're not My people. I will say to them who... He says, you are not My people. Why? Because they were apostate from God. When you are not with God, it doesn't matter that you used to be God's people. 
If you're not with God today, you're not one of His people. The business about being sealed with the Holy Spirit and no one can break the seal but Christ, I think, is a not an argument that makes exegetical sense because the seals on the seven sealed book in Revelation, which no one could break except Christ the Lamb, are not never equated in Scripture with the seal of the Holy Spirit on the church. The book and the church are two different things, and the seals are obviously similar language, similar imagery, but for different concepts. I, I wouldn't see that as a, uh, an argument worth uh, leaning too heavily upon. Now, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to save some of the things that Tom just talked about, to, and I'll address those in my second rebuttal, but he did bring up something very important that is often brought up in favor of eternal security, and that is 1 Corinthians 3. That was not brought up in his presentation, and I didn't bring it up in mine, but it's a good one to look at because most people hang a lot on it who hold the eternal security view. If you look there quickly, I'd like to see whether we are exegeting this passage correctly. Paul said, in verse 10, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet is so by fire. Now, is this talking about the carnal Christian? I was raised in a tradition that taught the foundation is laid in my life when I'm converted. That No other foundation will be laid. It's Christ Jesus. Now, the rest of my life, I'm building on that foundation by doing good things or bad deeds. If I'm doing good things, I'm building with my life gold, silver, precious stones. If bad deeds, I'm building with you know, wood, hay, and stubble. And on the day of judgment, if I lived a totally carnal, rebellious, unbelieving life, I still have that foundation there, and I'll be saved, yet as by far, I'll just lose my rewards, right? That's how I've been taught it. It's not what Paul's talking about at all. Paul's not descri- describing anyone who's carnal. He's not describing anyone who's lost their faith. He's describing himself and Apollos. And anyone who chooses to can prove that to himself from the context. You see, in verse 9, Paul says, For we meaning himself and Apollos, are God's fellow workers. You, meaning the church in Corinth, are God's field. You are God's building. Now, he compares the church in Corinth with a building and with a field. And himself and Apollos, co-workers on these projects, seen these two ways. If you look earlier in the passage, he says in verse 5, Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? Well, that's the question he answers in verse 9. We, Paul and Apollos, are God's fellow workers. What is the church? The church is God's field and God's building. Well, look at verse 6. I planted, that's in a field, Apollos watered. That's also in the field, isn't it? The church is God's field. Paul got there first. He planted the seeds. Apollos watered the seeds and God gave the increase. Okay, now let's change the metaphor to a building. The church is God's field. This is a building. How about the building? Okay, as a building. I, Paul, I laid the foundation. Just like if you want to see the church as a field, I planted the seeds. See it as a building, I laid the foundation. What did Apollos do? Well, seen as a field, Paul watered the seeds. Seen as a building, Apollos built on the foundation that I laid here in Corinth but with his teaching and so forth. And others will do the same. But everyone who does so better look out what they do because if they build on this foundation, if they build up the church with inferior stuff, that man, though he may be a man of God, and may his, his salvation may not be in question. He's not, he's not describing a carnal Christian. He's talking about people like Apollos and other men who will build on the foundation Paul laid in, in Corinth. Just, or others who come and water the seeds. Those people had better be faithful workers for God because they'll lose rewards they otherwise would have had if they do a poor job of it. But there's no discussion here about a person who believes in Christ, rejects the faith, goes off and lives in sin. There's no, there's, that person is not in view in this passage. It's, it's out of the purview of the passage. He's talking about ministers who teach the church, all of them presumably Christians, all of them presumably living godly lives, but some of them build the church poorly. And those who do are going to have a, a, a product that is not going to stand the test of the fire when God brings the test. The man himself is a Christian. He'll be saved. But he's not describing what some people think. He's not describing a man who, you know, I had a foundation of Christ in my life when I accepted Christ when I was four years old. If I go out and live as a Satanist and die as a Satanist at age 50, 
You know, does that mean I have the foundation still there, but I just have been building with wood hand stuff and I just lose my rewards? No. My condition at death is that which determines my condition. So said the, in the verses I brought up earlier. I don't have to get. I don't have to go over them all again. The person who who is a servant of God, if he's faithful and Christ comes back, he'll be rewarded. If that same servant is unfaithful, he'll be awarded the same penalty as the unbelievers. That's what Christ said. Christ even said to his own disciples in Matthew chapter 18, he told the parable about the man who had been forgiven by the king. Then he found someone else who owed him something he wouldn't forgive him. He said the king got angry at that. The man who had been forgiven was unforgiven. Do you remember that? The king said, you worthless servant, I forgave you all that debt. You should have forgiven your servant. Since you didn't, I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to deliver you to the tormentors until you pay everything now. And what was Jesus' final words on that parable? You can read it. The last verse in Matthew 18. He says, so also shall my heavenly Father do to you if you do not every man from his heart forgive his brother their trespasses. What shall my heavenly Father do to you? The same thing that king did. He unforgave him because he didn't forgive. Jesus said, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Jesus said it four times in the Gospels. How many times do you have to say it before it's an established doctrine of Scripture? Now, when Jesus said, so shall my heavenly Father do to you, who was he talking to in Matthew 18? Peter and the apostles. He was alone with them. Peter said, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times maybe? And Jesus said, no. Seventy times, and they told this parable. This is a private conversation with the disciples. And to them, he said...